Well, yesterday we talked about what happened on the voyage that the pilgrims took across the Atlantic from England to the New World. Now, there are a couple of things we haven't finished yet. We found out yesterday about the, the sailor who uh, made fun of the pilgrims, uh, cursed them, and what happened to him, that he caught something in the morning and was dead by that uh, night and was the, the only one who died uh, on the way, except for one other person. Uh, one other young man refused to listen to the advice of his elders uh, when told to drink lemon juice daily to prevent scurvy, and sure enough, he contracted scurvy and died. So two people died on the way over. Uh, there was one other near death, and that's an interesting event. Uh, his name was John Howland. John Howland just could not stand the uh, stuckiness of being in that lower deck, and especially during a fierce storm. Uh, he just couldn't stand it anymore. And although it was against the rules to go up on deck, he did it. He went up, he, he had, just had to get some fresh air. Well, he wasn't up there very long before a wave came and threw him overboard. Uh, I mean, there's no chance to rescue someone in that situation. But God was with him. For as he was flying through the air, through the water, down over the side of the ship, his hand reached out and caught a hold of a halyard rope that was hanging loose from the ship. And the sailors were able to pull him back on board with the aid of a boat hook. Now what are the odds of reaching out and grabbing a hold of a rope that is flying away from the ship as well. So the, those on board certainly consider it to be a miraculous event. And we might we find it even more interesting when we understand who some of his descendants were and what life in America would have been like without them. Some of you who are familiar with uh, Phillips Brooks, you're certainly familiar with the song he wrote, O Little Town of Bethlehem. He was a descendant of John Howland, who would not have had that song if Howland had died. Henry W. Longfellow, that I mentioned to you the other day that none of you had ever read, is worthy of reading, and he also is a descendant of John Howland, a great American poet. A Ralph Waldo Emerson, philosopher and writer, who was also one of his descendants. And uh, I wonder if any of you know who that is. He's holding some golden tablets, and there's a, uh, an angel speaking to him. Well, that is none other than Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or what are commonly called Mormons. Another descendant is Franklin D. Roosevelt, of course, one of our presidents, president during World War II. Um, here's one of my favorite actors. He is a descendant of John Hallen. Uh, do any of you know who he is? His most famous role was in a movie that I think is one of the best ever made, Casablanca, in which he uh, has some famous lines that were repeated over and over again. Humphrey Bogart is his name. And the entire Bush family are descendants of John Howland. So, what would American history have been like if John Howland had not grabbed a hold of that rope? If God had not placed it there to rescue him from his foolishness? Well, something else happened on the way across the ocean, too. Uh, there was a birth. I told you about that yesterday. Elizabeth Hawkins gave birth to a baby boy while at sea, naming him Oceanus. Well, there was another birth on board ship, although it was after they had actually reached land, and that was Susanna White gave birth, naming that boy Peregrine. So there were two that died on the ship, and two were born on the ship. Now, they also almost had a near disaster of the whole company, about part, halfway through the Atlantic Ocean. 
Uh, the huge cross beam that supports the main mast. Here's the main mast here. Uh, the cross beam that supports that uh, during a storm cracked. And try as they might, the sailors could not budge it back into place. And without that, uh, they were not going to be able to sail. They would be lost at sea. Uh, the separatists prayed, Yet, Lord, thou canst save. Then William Brewster, one of the separatists, remembered the great iron screw of his printing press down in the lower deck. It was located, and with that great iron screw, they were able to maneuver the beam back into place and save the whole group on board ship. Well, when they arrived, they arrived someplace different than what was anticipated. They were supposed to be going to Virginia, the Virginia colony. But instead, they landed in what was called, and still is, New England. Now, why did that happen, first of all? Well, the reason given in the reports were that they got blown off course, and that's where they landed. But I'm not so sure, because the captains of ships had uh, maps, they, they knew where they were going, they could read the, the stars in the sky. Um, it's hard to believe that they couldn't have gotten back on course again. Think about this. Would there be a good reason why the separatists would not have wanted to land in Virginia and preferred to land further north? Think about what they would have found in Virginia, especially as to who would be in charge. Think about who they're trying to escape in England. They're trying to escape the authority of the Church of England. Well, was there a church established in Virginia? Yes, there was, the Church of England. So it may be that they really did not want to land where they were given permission to land uh, because they did not want to have the Church of England uh, lording over them. And so there are some who suggest that landing in New England was intentional. Well, we don't know for sure. But when they landed outside of the boundaries of the Virginia colony, the strangers on board began to have ideas of mutiny. Uh, they were tired of the saints lording over them. Uh, of telling them uh, how they were in charge, and they certainly didn't want to live in a settlement in which the saints were the government. And so many of them were talking about just striking out on their own when they got to land. Well, that would have meant disaster for this new settlement. And so there had to be some kind of an agreement reached. So the leaders of the strangers and of the saints got together and decided to agree with one another on a contract that all would follow. And what is that called? It's called the Mayflower Compact. I dare say none of you have read the Mayflower Compact, but it's not very long, so we're gonna look at it together. So let's examine what it says. First of all, notice, it starts out, in the name of God, amen. So, at the very beginning, it acknowledges God and continues to acknowledge God. As we get past the, uh, the names underwritten, our royal subjects of the king, etc., etc., they give then the purpose. He says, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith. What was their primary goal in coming to America? It was to bring glory to God. Why? Well, because that was their goal in whatever they did in life. Uh, these men and women of God uh, saw their whole lives as being dedicated to God. And notice what else? To advance the Christian faith, to evangelize. They wanted to bring the gospel to those in that new land that had not heard. And the strangers agreed to this. Then they add on also that it was for honor of the king and country. And so they took a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. 
do by these presents, that means those that were there, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. In other words, we, we agree together to form a government for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. What's the best way to accomplish the glory of God, advancement of the Christian faith, and honoring king and country? It's by being organized, by having government that, that puts uh, the evil of men under control. And so they recognize that that was necessary. And by virtue hereof, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices, from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony. So what are they saying? Uh, we agree that we're going to set up a government that whenever it's necessary, we'll enact laws, uh, we'll appoint officers, well, whatever is needed in order to have a functioning government that will enable us to be successful. And then notice, this is key here. Unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. So even the strangers agreed, we will be submissive to the government that is established. And then, in witness, they signed it together. And uh, notice it's the 11th of November, uh, Anno Domini, Year of Our Lord, 1620. Now, many have said that the Mayflower Compact, because of its establishment of government, by the consent of the governed, they are agreeing together to form a government, that this is one of the foundational documents of the United States of America. And I have to agree, and that's why we're spending time looking at this era of our past, because what transpired with these people who came over, these pilgrims, and later we'll see others that come over, uh, greatly influenced our country, the principles that uh, established our country. So that is the Mayflower Compact. The four major ideals from this compact are deep faith and belief in God and his divine guidance. Secondly, deep loyalty to native England and the king. Even though they've been persecuted and exiled by his actions. We're going to see that come into play much later, even when we get to the War of Independence that uh, the people of this land were loyal to England and the king. Expresses their mutual regard for one another as equals. So no more of uh, one group lording it over another. Uh, we're all going to be viewed as equals. And then their intent to establish just and equal laws upon which would be built a truly democratic form of government. A government that uh, was founded on the will of the people. Uh, the first in recorded history. So that's why the Mayflower Compact is so important for our understanding of what the United States was to become. Uh, John Carver was elected the first governor under this compact, but unfortunately he died shortly after uh, they uh, landed and was followed by William Bradford who served for many years, I believe over 40 years. He also wrote an account of the colony, a history of it called Plymouth Plantation. So next, they had to find a home. Uh, the first place they landed wasn't going to be necessarily the place where they're going to live. And so they, they sent out parties to look. You know, so they're looking all around Cape Cod here, uh, what would be the best place to live? And they eventually focused on this area that was called Plymouth. Now, while they were doing that, remember the, the Billings family that uh, were uh, up to uh, no good a lot of the time? I'm sorry, Billington family. Well, here's something that happened while people were out, some men were out looking for a place to live, uh, including his father. Uh, Francis Billington made some squibs or little firecrackers and set them off inside the ship near the caskets or the barrels of gunpowder. He also fired a musket in that area. And so it's a miracle that he didn't set off the gunpowder and blow up the whole ship. 
we're going to come across his brother doing something a little bit later. Uh, this is a picture of the longboat that was used to go exploring. And they uh, looked around. A lot of interesting things happened while they were exploring, from having to sleep all night out in freezing rain and snow, to encounters with Indians, uh, shooting arrows at the pilgrims and the pilgrims shooting back, uh, and just trying to find a place to live. You know, think about what would what would define a good place to live? What would you be looking for? You'd be looking for a place where there's fresh water. What else? Good soil, right? Having woods nearby. Uh, why would you need woods? Yeah, because you need to, to get wood to build your houses. Okay. Oh, and there'll be animals in the woods as well that you uh, would want to, for food and to uh, make clothing, other things out of their skins. Uh, you'd also want a place that had a little bit of a hill, at least, so that you could that'd be a good place for defense. And, and so they looked all around, and they finally found the place that matched that. And here's a painting that was done by someone to show the landing of the pilgrims. Uh, what do you notice here? Yeah, it's, it's winter time. Not the best time of year to go moving into a home, right? And especially if you've got to build that home. But that's what they had to do. Now they began uh, building, they, they found the land around December 20th, and they began building their first building December 25th. That date mean anything to you? Yeah, it's Christmas. Now why would they begin building on Christmas? Wouldn't you think they'd want to celebrate Christmas first and then build the building? Well, the reason is that they did not celebrate Christmas. And I think the reason they even started building on Christmas was uh, related to why they didn't celebrate Christmas. Remember, Christmas is made up of two words, Christ's Mass. Now, that comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, the reason they were wanting to get away from the Church of England was not because of the doctrine of the Church, they agreed with that, but because of the practice of the Church, the, the liturgy, which was just like the Roman Catholic Church. And so this was the, kind of their way of thumbing their nose at the Pope, I suppose, to start building on December 25th. Now, what was the first building that they built? Oh, I should mention this. Uh, when they first arrived, when they landed on shore, of course, they gave thanks to God for uh, providing a place for them. Uh, fortunately, uh, political correctness had not uh, invaded the land yet, and so this did not happen. Hey, no praying here. This is a public beach. Well, that wouldn't happen until several centuries later. As they arrived, uh, they realized that they were getting low on food, especially uh, food to plant, seeds to plant. Because they weren't sure that the wheat and the rye that they brought with them would grow there in that land. Uh, but they found baskets of corn buried in what they came to call Corn Hill. And uh, they looked around to find out who, who is it that owns this, and they couldn't find anyone. They wanted to, to buy corn from them because they would be sure that that would grow. And so they simply gathered up a lot of it uh, and, uh, and took it themselves. Uh, there's the plaque there now commemorating Corn Hill, uh, the beach that is there where they found corn buried, and they took it. Now, there's some who... Uh, you say, well, you know, were they guilty of stealing uh, as they took this corn out of the ground and belonged to someone else and, and filled kettles up with it in their pockets and everything to try to take as much back as they could? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, technically, you'd have to say, uh, did they ever steal? Yeah, they did. They, they took that corn uh, from uh, someone else. Uh, but they did not do it maliciously or intend to steal. They would have paid for it if they could have found anybody around to whom it belonged. And they fully intended to pay someone later, which they did. Uh, so the, uh, the, the stealing of the corn, uh, some people like to make out uh, as a negative thing for uh, these uh, pilgrims. But in reality, they were trying to survive. 
and were willing to pay for what they had taken. Uh, what's the first building they build as they begin working there on land? Uh, the first one was a meeting house. Now, why do they call a meeting house or common house is the word used here? Um, what was it for? Well, it was for any meetings that they might need to have. It also functioned as a, a port being built on top of the hill. Um, but it also served as a place for the church to meet. So why did they call it a church? Well, they understood that a church was not a building, but the people. And so the church would meet in the meeting house or the common house. So they built that first, and that also served as a place for uh, people to uh, be put who became ill. It served as a hospital as well. Well, they built this meeting house, and then they were free to build their own homes. And they did not build a lot of cabins, like a lot of people think. Uh, they built houses just like they had back in England. And, and so they made boards and uh, and and put them together in the same way. Now, it was uh, particularly uh, windy that winter. In fact, it was so windy and stormy that uh, while the men were building the common house, uh, it took 26 days to finish it. And, and at the same time, the captain of the Mayflower had to put two extra anchors in the water to keep the ship from blowing away. But even at that, it was a mild winter by New England standards. But the colonists were unprepared for such cold weather, especially lacking enough provisions. Now, why were they unprepared? If you look at a map, you see that England is uh, the place of origin. New England is, is here. You know, what's the latitude difference? England's much further north in the latitude. Look, it's, it's across from part of Canada, not that far from Greenland. And, and usually we would expect that further north would be warmer or colder. Yeah, colder. So why was it that it was actually colder here than they were used to in England? Well, it has to do with wind currents. Now, wind currents is what brings us weather. And which way do wind currents flow? They flow from west to east. So when you look at the United States, uh, North America, you see that the winds flow this way, west to east. And when wind flows across land, what does it do? It picks up the cold from the land. And so the winds coming into New England were coming across land, sometimes from Canada from polar winds coming down, and so that makes it much colder here because you're getting cold winds. Now, what about England? Why is England not cold? Well, England's winds come from the water, and what does water pick or what does wind pick up going across water? It picks up the warmth of the water, and especially considering that. The Gulf of Mexico is the source of what's called the Gulf Stream, which is a stream of water in the ocean. There are streams in the ocean. And this stream of water goes from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up into this area so that there's warm water flowing and the winds blowing then onto the British Isles bring a warm wind and a much milder climate there. So they were unprepared for how cold it would be in this new land. In fact, it was so cold that many of them died that year. Over 50 of the people died, including half the crew. Four complete families died. 13 out of 18 women died. But no girls died, and only three boys died. Now, when I saw those figures, I began to wonder, <clears throat> why is it so out of skew? Why did so many women die and so few children? Are children more resilient? Well, I'm not so sure that that would be the case. Uh, some students have suggested that 
uh, maybe the women were the ones taking care of all the ill people and they became ill themselves. There might be some truth to that, although men also help to take care of the sick people. But I wonder what it is about a mother and the women in relationship to the children. I can't prove this, I've never seen anybody write this anywhere, but just thinking about it, I wonder if these women, these mothers, did not sacrifice themselves for their children. And when it came to dividing up the food, that they did not take as much and gave more to their children. For no girls died and only three boys. I think that's a picture of the sacrifice that these women made for the survival of the future of the colony. Well, they built houses, as I said, like they were used to back in England. This is a picture of uh, a house, a one large room, a fireplace at this end. Uh, you can see uh, some furniture around. Steps going up to a second loft, which is often where the children slept, uh, where supplies would be stored. Uh, notice the roof is a thatched roof made out of uh, grass and weeds and reeds. And uh, what about locks? Well, if you're a pilgrim, you never lose your key, house key because it was attached to the door. They used wooden pegs attached to a string that pulled the latch to open a door. They trusted their neighbors not to come in and steal anything. Uh, here's a picture of a reconstructed house in Plymouth Plantation. And uh, you get an idea of what they look like and uh, uh, the, a lot of greenery around uh, some of the wild, some of the planted uh, fence there as well. Uh, this is looking down on Plymouth Plantation on the main street. They did have streets. It's a rather wide street here, the main street of town and others crisscrossing. Uh, this is looking down hill from uh, the meeting house, which doubled as a fort, and it's where they put Miles Standish's cannon. Now, what direction do you think Miles Standish's cannon was placed? Was it placed facing the woods, where they might have attacked from Indians, or was it placed facing the water? It was actually placed facing the water. Why? What would, what would they be in danger from in the water? Well, they were afraid that they might be attacked by the Spanish. Yeah, that far north. The Spanish had uh, gone along the coast, uh, a number of places along the coast, and attacked the English. And so they were more afraid of the Spanish than they were the Indians. Well, as we mentioned, that first winter was uh, very difficult. And one of the things that caused some difficulty was another one of the Billington boys. Francis set off the fireworks, and his brother John was also a troublemaker. And one day he wandered off into the woods and got lost. So everybody's out there looking for him. Where is this boy? Uh, they're afraid maybe he'd be captured by Indians, or maybe he'd starve to death. Well, at some time, they got word from some other Indians that they had seen him with uh, the, the nearby Nauset Indian. Uh, and it was arranged for them to bring him to the colony, to the settlement. And when he arrived, he was covered with uh, feathers. Uh, he had uh, necklace beads around his neck that the Indians had given him. Well, the adults were very angry with him for all the trouble. But the children uh, were quite amused and taken by the fact that he had all this stuff that he'd gotten from the Indians, and also the tales of his adventure. As I mentioned before, all those who were sick were crammed together in the common house. Uh, at one time, there were only seven that were able to care for all the sick. William Bradford wrote that the healthy pilgrims spared no pains night or day, but with abundance of toil and hazard of their own health, fetched them wood, made them fires, dressed them meat, that's food, made their beds, washed their loathsome clothes, clothed and unclothed them, a rare example and worthy to be remembered. As I said, 50 of them died, but they always buried them at night. Think about that. Why would they bury them at night in unmarked graves? Yeah, they didn't want the Indians 
to see them burying their dead because they didn't want the Indians to know how many of them had died and how weak they were becoming. They weren't sure what to make of the Indians around the area, and they didn't want to invite attack by broadcasting to them that uh, many of them were dying. Well, it wasn't long before John Billington was arrested at Troubles of Family. He was arrested for refusing to take his turn guarding the colony. Can you imagine? Well, he was sentenced to have his neck and heels tied together, and so he decided, uh, well, maybe it would, would be a good idea to take up his guard position. But what a family. I guess every community probably has one. Well, tomorrow we'll find out about the first contact with some friendly Indians, uh, a guy you've probably heard of, Samoset. And so we'll be looking at, at uh, this positive turn tomorrow.